Well, good morning. I hope you're excited because um, next week, next week is our annual family retreat. Um, if, I hope you're planning on going. If you have not signed up, what are you waiting for? It's going to be a really great time where we really want you to be there. Um, come and worship together with us and come and experience God's grace together with us. And I really believe that God has in store for us a special time and we don't want you to miss out. And so if you have not yet signed up, sign up today. Um, we will not be meeting here neither for the 930 worship or the two o'clock worship, and so there will not be an English worship. Actually, there will not be any worship here at Antioch next Sunday. So um, come, please come to the retreat center um, and come and have a great time. Sandy Cove in Ocean City, Maryland. I think it's Ocean City. Um, Please come join us. I love retreats. I love retreats mainly because I think it's a special time that God kind of sets us apart, uh, sets the time apart for us, right? He designed that time for us to just kind of let go of all the other distractions and just to have fun together, but also to worship together, to experience his presence together. Um, When I was younger, I loved retreats for different reasons. Um, I loved retreats because it was always a fun time, right? And I remember going to a retreat center, and I would go, we would go, and we would have worship, but along the side of the room, there would always be this huge stack of snacks, right? Um, You know what I'm talking about, right? They would have like different like uh, cup noodles, right? And they would have different like um, chocolates and and drinks and all these things that that would just be there and you can basically just take for whatever you want, right? Um, I remember at the end of the evening, like all the guys would all just be standing there like like stuffing their pockets, right? With chips and like stuff and you're like chocolate in your pockets and drinks and and you're walking out like as if nothing happened. You're you're like, (laughs) and you just... At the, at the end of the middle of the night, all the, everybody would gather together in somebody's room, and everyone would just kind of like, like give their spoils out, right? Everyone would be just eating together. There would be this one person. There would always be one person who would be like saving theirs for later. Like messed up, right? Like, come on, we're all in this together, right? Um, I thought about that when it comes to, because, you know, lately we've been talking about what belongs to God. We've been talking about what is it that truly belongs to God, and um, we've been Basically, it came from um, the verse in Matthew where Jesus was asked, should we be paying taxes, right? And so Jesus asked them, go ahead and show me a denarius. And so they give him a denarius, and he says, whose face is on this? They say, it's Caesar's. So he says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. And so with that in mind, we ask the question, well, what is God's? You know, what is it that belongs to God? And we talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, where it began to tell us, look, it's worship and service that belongs to God. It, all worship and all of God's service, it belongs to him. It, God is worthy of it, and he requires it of you. He demands it from you. He demands worship, and he demands service, obedience. In Deuteronomy 5, and also in Exodus 20, where we get the Ten Commandments, he says, look, I require of you the Sabbath. It's mine. It's my day, and I require that of you. That you would rest on that day, that you would spend that time to focus on him and focus on the cross and the resurrection. Then in Malachi 3, he said something that we have sometimes a difficult time with. He says, the tithe, 10% of your gross income, I require that of you. Because it's not yours. It was never yours. I'm the one that gave it to you, and I require it back. If you remember in Haggai chapter 1, it's really been eating away and burning in my heart, and that's the reason why I've been repeating these words over and over and over again. It says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. See, this is when the temple of God was in ruin. And God was calling on his people to say, look, stop building your own home and look at my house. Look at what's happened to it. Will you live for me and not for yourself? And we as God's people, we've all responded. Hopefully we've all responded. Yes, Lord God, my life is yours. And as I, as I live my life for you, Lord, that means that I will build your house first. 
I'll build your house first. Today, I want to share with you the verse from Chronicles, 1 Chronicles. And this is a time when David, although David did not build the temple of God, he was building up and building up all the resources in order to build the temple of God. Right? And so it, the chapter begins with him saying, look, this is what we've built. This is what we saved. This is what we have accumulated in order for us to give. And he is so excited about everything that God has done, everything that he was able to give together as a people. And he begins to praise the Lord, it says. They would praise the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, praise be to you, Lord, the God of our Father Israel, from, every, from everlasting to everlasting, yours, Lord, is the greatest, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You're the ruler of all things. You're in your hand are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. You see what he's doing? He's worshiping God. He's telling God, Lord God, we're so thankful. We're so grateful that we're able to come together and give this offering to you. We're so thankful that we're able to come together and build your temple. You see, the reason why when he writes that, he is actually really, really excited about this fact. You see, because God, David wanted to build God's temple. He had this desire in his heart, and God was like, nope, it's not going to be you. you, need you to, I need you to just hold back. So David's like, all right, if I can't be the one to build it, I want to prepare for it. And he sees and he realizes what an honor it is for him to be able to be a part of building up the temple of God. Now today when we talk about the temple of God, we oftentimes will talk about the church. And so this will be something that churches very often will use. Right? This, this is the type of um, verse that we will use when it's time for some kind of building um, building campaign, right? If when we are doing renovations in a church or if we're doing a, start, a new build, this, these are the type of words that we'll use because we'll say, look, this is what we need. You know, we need people to give. And it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. David begins to say this. But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give generously, as generously as this? Everything comes from you. And I've given you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors. Our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all the abundance that we have provided for building you, a temple for your holy name, comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. You get what he's saying? He's saying, who are we that you would choose us to glorify your name? You see, what we fail to realize is, is what an honor it is for us to actually look to the God of heavens, the God Almighty, and for him to say, I choose you. You see, the thing is, God is glorified, no matter what. In all things, God is glorified. There's a song that I used to sing as a child. Um, my wife used to sing as a child, and recently, my daughter Abigail recently learned. All right? And it goes like this. If I were a butterfly, if I were a butterfly, remember that? I thank you, Lord, for giving me wings. If I were a robin in the tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could sing. Right? Basically, he said, it's saying, no matter what I am, no matter what part of creation that I belong to, I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Lord. And Jesus says something similar to that. Right? As Jesus was entering into Jerusalem, and all these people are shouting and proclaiming, on Palm Sunday, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David, which means, Lord, save. And 
people said to him, would you silence your disciples? Look at them. And you know what Jesus says? He says, look, if they stopped, the rocks would cry out in their place. See, God is so great. God is God and God is God of all of creation, so much so that every single person in all of God's creation declares how great God is. And yet, in, in the vast creation, he has chosen people like you and me to build up his temple, to build up creation. And David's like, Everything that we have was given to you to begin with, given from you to begin with. Everything that I have, Lord God, every single aspect of my life, whether it, I feel like I've worked hard for it or not, it all came from you. The skills that I have in order to be able to have a job comes from you. The fact that we are here alive in the United States where we live in abundance all of that, Lord, it comes from you. Every breath that I breathe, it comes from you. The very faith that I have, that I may see the cross and know of your resurrection and bow before you, God, even that, Lord, it comes from you. So, Lord God, when he makes this proclamation, who are we, who am I, and who are my people? What he's saying is, God, you've shown me grace from beginning to end. All of it is mercy. And so when I give, I'm only returning to you what you've given to me. I'm only returning to you, Lord, what it is that you've given to me. So David is so excited. He's been given this privilege to be able to build up the temple of God. But what about you today, brother and sister? You see, my fear is that very often in our lives, we take for granted who God really is and how worthy God is of our worship. There are times when we look at God and we see him as an equal or see him as a peer or as a friend. And we, when he asks us to serve him, when he calls on us to worship him, feels like a burden rather than a privilege and we feel like God I have all these other things that I need to be responsible for with my resources and I have all these other things in my life where I need to use my time and so God it's a struggle and I realize the reason for that is because we don't quite understand who it is that's calling us we don't quite see the greatness of our God. And we look at him simply as a peer or as a friend. And we say, well, he's a needy friend. He's a jealous friend. And because of that, Lord God, fine, I'll hang out with you. Fine, I'll come to church on Sundays. Fine, I'll read the Bible. Fine, I'll pray. But God, you owe me for that. Sometimes I feel that way. Sometimes I forget what an honor it is. Sometimes I lose the heart of David who says, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? See, what he's saying is this in a certain way. The reason why I'm able to give generously, God, is because you have given so generously to me. He looks at his life and he can only lift up words of thanks. He, lifts, he looks at his life and he can only look at it and say, God, to you be all the glory. You see, the problem is for us, a lot of times when we look at our lives, we complain. When we look at our lives, we think of all the things that we don't quite have. And we look at our lives and we compare ourselves to other people who seem more happy, to other people who seem as though they have more than us. And we complain and we are so miserable because of it. But in every moment of our lives, we have the opportunity to worship God or to complain to him. Because God has given so generously to us. And we can look at it and say, God, I want to give back because you've been so generous. Or we can just hold tightly because we say, God, I just don't have enough. 
you haven't provided enough. The reality is that choice is ours. That choice is yours. What will you focus on? What is it that you will have your mind set on? Here's David. Who am I? And who are my people? Everything comes from you. You know, I think about how did this happen? Like it, basically, he called on the people of Israel to give generously. And the reason why he worships God like this is because the people responded. The people responded. You know, it was at that point they gave everything that they had and they were glorifying God for the opportunity to do so. And David writes this, this poem or this praise to worship God, to say, thank you, Lord God. Everything is of you and everything comes from you. We just want to worship you. But how did this happen? In 1 Chronicles chapter 29, it begins with David saying, look, this is who I am. This is what I've done. And he begins to say everything that he shared. And then he asks this question. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? He asks that question. Who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord? It says, then the leaders of families, the officers of the tribes of Israel, the commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds and the officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. There was an example that was set. First, it was set by David. But then after that, all the leaders of the people stood up and gave freely. All the leaders stood up and began to give and it says they gave towards the work in the temple, God, five, temple of God 5,000 talents and, and 10,000 darics and of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 100, talents of iron. They just gave freely. All of God's people began to give. It started with leaders. It started with the leaders. See, I realize this is a call for myself, but for so many of you, deacons, committee leaders, life group leaders, that we would set the example of what it means to actually follow Christ, trusting him with everything. To say to him, Lord God, I'm going to put my faith in you and not in myself and not in what I have acquired and not in all of my gifts and not in my time and not in my resources, but God, I want to trust it in you. It says, anyone who had precious stones gave them to the treasure of the temple of the Lord in the custody of Jehiel from the Gershonite. The people rejoiced at the willing response of their, of their leaders, for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. You see, when leaders stand up, we set an example. People rejoice. So, for myself, for the leaders of the church, it's a call. It's a conviction. That God is calling upon us to say, do better. When you feel as though the church and the people of God are holding back, it's because we, as leaders, very often are holding back as well. But I realize it can't just be limited to those who call themselves or consider themselves leaders, but that we each, every single one of us, are called to the exact same thing. Because every single one of us have been gifted by God. Every single one of us have received from him, and we're now called to return unto him. I want you to realize this. When we're talking about this, of course, back in the Old Testament, it was gold and silver and iron and bronze. That was what they built the temple of God with. 
today, you and I are called God's temple. Today, you and I are called the church, the body of Christ. It says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You get that? You and I are living stones. You see, because for so many of us, when we envision the church, when we envision, envision the temple, we think of a building. And so God says, well, through Peter, he says, look, if you envision a building, then you are the stones. You are the stones. And the stones, as they build on top of each other, were building a spiritual house. You see, the thing is, the illustration works perfectly. Because a lot of times when we ourselves are not committed and giving ourselves to the Lord, think of a building that are missing bricks. Think of a building that are missing cinder block or stones, building materials. What would you call it? You'd call it abandoned. You'd call it a ruin. I wonder if that's not what our church is like sometimes. Sure, we are worshiping here in a beautiful sanctuary, but what does the body of Christ actually look like to the Lord? When there are stones that are missing, when there are living stones that are not here, serving their purpose, we are abandoned. We are a ruin. The words of Haggai ring clearly in my ears. All of us are busy building up our own homes, our own houses, while the church of God, while the temple of God remains a ruin. Leaders, I say that to myself, we need to set the example. We need to step up. That we would stop being so busy with ourselves to say to the Lord, God, you are worthy. When I consider who you are, God Almighty, when I consider God of creation, when I consider who you are, God, I give praise to you, thanks to you, that I can give so generously for everything that I have comes from you. Do you believe that in your heart today? I want to ask you that sincerely. Do you believe that in your heart today? So many of us, we're taking credit for ourselves, for our own hard work. We say, I worked hard, and I'm gifted, I'm smart, and I made myself, and I've made something out of nothing, and I've become great on my own. And I want you to know that's the lie of the enemy. Everything that we have is from God. Give it back so that he can do great things through you. Let's spend some time praying together now.